I'm Francis Campoy, and I'm a developer advocate at Google, working with the Go team in Mountain View. And as Sylvain said, my day-to-day -day job is based on this, increasing adoption. We do a lot of things to increase adoption. And one of the most important things, I think, at least in my opinion, is to make Go easier to learn. There's a lot of things that we do for this. And I'm not going to get into the detail. But basically, if you go through the Go tour, that's one of the things that we do. But we also do talks, and we also generate uh, content like blog posts and so on. And as working and developing these contents, I've learned a lot about the language, but also I've learned a lot about the way we learn Go. And today I wanted to share a little bit the things that I've discovered by doing this. So before we speak about Go, uh, I, as he said, I speak four languages, but I'm actually, which means that I'm, a, I'm very good at learning languages, but I'm also an expert at failing to speak languages. I'm learning Chinese, which is a very good way of failing to learn a language. <laughs> but what I want to talk about is that I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, so I moved to France like seven years, no, 10 years ago. I'm old. 10 years ago, <laughs> I moved to France. And uh, during my first year, I got a cold. And I wanted to tell my, my roommate that I wouldn't be going to school because I got a cold. And I wanted to say it in French. Turned out that my French was pretty bad at that point. And do you know how to say I caught I called in Spanish? Estoy constipado. <laughs> so you can imagine what I said. Yeah. <laughs> I know. So this is what we call false friends. <laughs> I only have 18 minutes, people. OK, so this is what we call false friends. And false friends occur in natural languages, but they also occur in programming languages. So in this case, we're seeing something that looks really similar. And we're iterating over a collection in Java, and we're iterating over the elements of a slice in Go. And it looks really similar, but it turns out that the second part of code is actually not correct. Because if you're doing this, actually you're iterating over the indexes, not the elements. And if you wanted to write correctly, it could be like this. So this is actually kind of a false friend from Java to Go. And my point here is actually not that uh, there's false friends and all of that. My main point is that when I was learning French, my reaction to my friend laughing at my face was basically saying, oh, I'm wrong. <laughs> but very often when we're learning a new language, our reaction is actually the opposite one. We're going to say, oh, this language is very bad design. It's, it's really weird to me. Well, I think that we should actually keep a little bit more the attitude of we're still learning. And at some point, we're going to be experts. And then if you want to complain about aspects of the language, of course. But when we're learning, very often we, we have a lot of background from other languages that can be a little bit difficult. Sometimes we speak correctly, but it sounds really weird. And this has happened to me before. Like uh, I started speaking English, and I said, for instance, I am born in Barcelona. And that's actually wrong. You say, I was born in Barcelona. It's still correct, but it sounds weird. What it means is that we're going to be, if you apply that into programming, you're going to be writing code that, that works, compiles, and runs, and all the tests pass. If you have tests, you should. And, uh, but it does just feel weird to people that actually write that code as a living. So this normally comes from uh, foreign influence. So in my case, I was basically translating je suis né in French to I am born in English, which is wrong. But you know, this kind of an influence. And programming languages, we have pretty much the same problem. So if we have this code here, we can see that the receiver is called this. And we, to access the fields in the struct, we're actually using get x, get y. And probably good, we could actually define one type profile. And what is this? This is actually a Java accent, clear Java accent. And this is correct code, but it just feels weird. In the same way, we could have something like this, where we use underscore before the, the structs, and we also use self as the receiver. And this is clearly Python. Finally, we have this code. And is this code better than the rest? Well, it works, and it does exactly the same thing. But I would say it's better, because this is what all the people in the Go community expect, because this is idiomatic Go code. Oh, now I see you. <laughs> OK, so now you're saying, OK, so there's these things that, uh, that, that are obvious, obviously uh, surprising, like false friends, and then things that come from different languages. But there's also things that are just hard to, to, to learn in a language. And I agree 100% with you, both for programming languages and natural languages. How many of you know how to pronounce that thing? How many of you are from Iceland? <laughs> oh, there you go. So <laughs> if you're not from Iceland, probably this is a hard one to say. 
And uh, so I wanted to know what were the difficult things when I was learning Go, but it turns out that I have a very bad memory. So I used lazy Twitter and I just asked, what is the best and the worst thing that you encounter while learning Go? And there was this answer that I really liked, which is the worst part was interfaces. And the best part was interfaces. And uh, I actually agree with, that, with the fact that interfaces are the cornerstone of the type system for Go. This is something that you, sh you should understand to write good code. So guess what we're going to be talking about now? Interfaces. So I'm not the first one to talk about interfaces during this conference, I know. And you've seen this slide before. <laughs> so I'm not going to explain in too much detail, but I'm going to be talking about interfaces from a slightly different point of view. For me, interfaces can be seen as a set of constraints on concrete types. So basically, the, string, the stringer interface is satisfied by just all the types that satisfy that constraint, which is having a method named string that returns a string. Now, when we define it as sets, all of a sudden we see that the name we use is not important. So uh, both type stringer here and type my cool stringer are both equivalent. And even if they were defined in different, uh, in different uh, contexts, they could still be exactly the same thing, and they're completely fungible which fungible means replaceable, and it doesn't mean something made of fungi, which I thought was that. So the, again, <laughs> false friend. Now we're going to see all the two interfaces that you've also seen, the reader and the writer. And we're also going to see one, which is the read writer. And a read writer is something that is both a reader and a writer. And we write this way, actually. And when we write this way, what we're saying is that a read writer has the methods, the set of methods of read writer is the union of the set of methods of reader and writer. And we can visualize sets. So if we visualize sets like this, we're going to see that there's, some, there's read writer, there's some types that, concrete types that satisfy those constraints. So OS.file uh, OS and net connection, they're both read writers. And uh, there's some types that are just readers, not read writers. But the important thing is that here, the more methods we add into, a, into an interface, the smaller the set of, of types that satisfy that interface will be. We can also start doing it a little bit more complicated and see that we have readers on one side, and writers on the other, and the, all the types that satisfy the methods which are the union, so read writer is the union of the methods of reader and the methods of writer, are actually the intersection of the types that satisfy reader and writer. And now we could think, OK, so what's the thing that is all around? Well, it has to include all the, all the types that are readers and all the types that are writer. Therefore, the interface should be the intersection of the sets of no, the section of the methods from reader and writer. And what is that intersection? It's an empty interface. And an empty interface is actually something pretty special and, uh, because it can, it can fit any value, any type, because all types in Go satisfy at least the methods. And uh, this might seem a little bit like uh, the object class in Java, but there's a big difference, which is in the object class in Java, there's actually this hierarchy that we're expressing via inheritance or sometimes uh, via uh, implements. So basically, we're saying we have all of our interfaces, and they're also extending one each other. While in Go, this is actually done just by natural composition. Basically, we define our sets. And de depending on what methods we define inside, we, they, they just compose organically, which means that our Go code, basically, we write our concrete types, and then we define our uh, interfaces on top of those once we start needing them. So all of you know that Go has implicit satisfaction. And implicit satisfaction can be, now that we're talking about sets, can be represented as this, saying that, for the type T to satisfy the interface I, the method set of I should be a subset of the method set of T. So T could have more methods, but it should have at least as many, all the methods that I has. And uh, to understand this, we have to understand what are method sets. And method sets are defined by Go specification in a very clear and concise way, but that can be a little bit confusing for newcomers. Let's break this apart. The first part is, the obvious one. The method set of an interface, it's all the sets in all the methods in that interface. So that's easy. The last one is the one that says that if you have a pointer, 
the method set for that value, for that type, is all the methods declare on the pointer, but also all the methods declare on the value itself. So if you have this code here, that I'm going to get much into detail, uh, we're passing a pointer to person, the p value. We're passing it to println, and println will check, is this p a stringer? Turns out it will check if the method set of pointer to p includes the string method, and it does, obviously. So this would print Hillary is six years old. But if we define our, uh, our method on the value itself, this will still work, because the method set includes both. Now, the opposite way, it doesn't work. And the opposite way, it doesn't work that way, because the method set of a type t is just the methods defined on t, not the methods defined on the pointer. So if we write, if we pass a person and the methods defined on person, this works. But if we pass a person and the methods defined on pointer to person, now it turns out that person is not a stringer anymore. So this will just print the standard, no, the, the normal way of printing uh, structs. So let's see why, because this is a little bit confusing and maybe it may seem like this just a um, uh, random choice. It's actually not at all. So when we define a, a method, we can choose between defining it on type T or its pointer. If we define it on one or the other, no matter what, if we have the same type, we can always call that method. If we have a person and the method is declaring person, it works. If it's a pointer to person and the method is declaring pointer to person, it also works. If we have a pointer to person, but the method is defined on person, we have to go from a pointer to its value. Turns out that from a type system point of view, this is completely well defined. So we can always do it every single time. We might have the case where there's an yield pointer, but the yield pointer is still from a, it, this is a runtime problem, not a type system problem. So this is a correct operation. It's universally valid. But what about this one? So now what we're trying to do is, given a value, we're trying to get the address. Is this doable? Well, in some cases, yes. If you have a variable, of course you can get the address. But what about this? What's the address of 42? Turns out that 42 doesn't have an address, which means that this is not universally valid. You cannot always do that operation. And if we turn that around, we're going to see that, so given a pointer to t, we can call both the methods on t and pointer to t. But if we have a t, we can only call the things on t because we cannot go back to the pointer. We're going to talk about nil. Nil is a pretty complicated thing, but nil is the default value for interfaces. So what do we have in here? So if we declare a variable of type interface and we don't initialize it, it will be nil. So if we print it, we're going to get nil. And if we compare it to nil, it will say, yeah, this is nil. But what if we actually initialize it with a nil pointer inside? So now p is a pointer to person that has not been initialized, therefore it's nil. And we're using it to initialize the stringer s. If we print p, it's nil. And if we compare it to nil, it says, yeah, of course. If we print s, it prints nil. But if we compare it to nil, it says, nope. Well, what is happening here? Well, what we have to understand is that interfaces are not just one value. They're actually made of two values itself. So we have the type of the value that is contained by the interface and the value. So when we have this code and we're initializing stringer with a pointer, turns out that what we have is an interface that contains a nil pointer to person. So actually, our interface says pointer to person nil. And this is not nil. This contains a nil pointer, but this is not a nil interface. Well, if we don't declare any, if we don't initialize the interface at all, we're going to see that when we print it, we will just see nil. And this is actually because there's, the type is nil. We, haven't have, we don't have a type yet in that interface. And also the value inside is nil. And this equals nil. And this takes us to the part where people write code and they're like, what? Which is this piece of code. Let's say the function do, it's actually returning an error, error which is an interface from the built-in package that is basically just one method that's error that returns a string. Now, we're declaring the error to be a pointer to do error, and do error satisfies error. Let's assume that, that the code is not there, but let's assume that it, it does. And we're returning that pointer to error. 
Turns out that even if that pointer is nil, when we're returning it as an interface, there's this conversion that is done, and what we're returning now is an interface that contains the type pointer to do error and the value nil. So in our code, in the main function, when we compare error to nil, it will say, yeah, it's not nil. So we'll actually get into the, that uh, uh, if statement, and we'll print the error. And what will we print? Nail. So this is a little bit surprising, but once you know what is happening before, this works. So these are some things that by teaching Go, especially teaching Go uh, internally at Google and having feedback from other Googlers, I, I discovered they were hard to understand. But they're not the only ones. There's also, uh, for instance, slices. Slices are actually very powerful. And they're actually designed in a way where the developer chooses what he's doing with the memory. So if you're coming from Python, in Python, every single, when you slice a slice, you get a copy of the new slice. So if you assume that that's the way it works, you're going to be confused. So it's important to understand really the basics of how it actually works to then understand all the, uh, all the side effects and how the language feels. And to end, I wanted to give you a little bit of guides to learn Go. So the first thing is know the basics. I think that knowing the basics is really important. Even if when you think that you know the basics, reread the spec. You're going to discover things that you thought that you understood, but you didn't. And this still happens to me. So <laughs> this is really important. Just reread the specs. It's a very dense document. It's very well written. And you will always discover new things. Uh, also, immersion. And immersion is important for any language. If you're trying to learn Chinese, the best thing to do is to move to China. Of course. I mean, it's kind of hard. But if you can, why not? That's the best way. For Go, it's if you want to learn Go, write Go code. But that's not enough. It's actually you should write Go code and share the code and get feedback from it. So write open source code, then share with the community and get feedback from it. The most important part of this part, though, is don't be embarrassed, which is also a false friend. Up to you to find out why. <laughs> don't be embarrassed. You're going to find, you're going to write code that is not correct. You're going to have false friends. You're going to have this accent from the accent, from the idiom, uh, from the language that you're coming from. And that's totally OK. And the best way to improve it is actually getting feedback from other people, understanding what is actually the automatic Go code. And finally, always pass what you learn. So if you learned something today, I really hope that you will actually share it to someone and get more people involved with Go. Why? Because this is my day-to-day -day job, and the more the merrier. <laughs> Thank you.